Hello and good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the 2020 Australian New Zealand EdTech 50. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you so much for joining us. My name's Patrick Brothers. I'm the co-CEO of Holland IQ. I'm joined by Maria Spees, my co-CEO of Holland IQ, and David Hi, Link, MD of Edugrowth. Thanks, Thanks for joining us, David. Thank you this very much for having me. It's been delightful. Pleasure. Looking forward to your remarks as well. This is the sixth of 10 regional series which we are doing. We're mapping the most promising ed tech startups around the world. Um, so far through 2020, we've mapped the China 100, the LATAM 100, the Southeast Asia 50, the Russia and CIS 100, and the Africa 50. Of course, Australia and New Zealand holds a special place as part of that series today. And over the course of the rest of the year, we'll be releasing the India and South Asia 50, the Europe 100, the North America 100, and the Middle East and North Africa 50. It's been a busy year for EdTech, as everyone knows. Let's make a start. We have a jam-packed 45 minutes for you ahead. Um, firstly, there's no one better place to um, provide an overview of the Australian EdTech ecosystem than EduGrowth. David's going to share some insights there. You'll also be pleased to know that 20% of the ANZ EdTech 50 is from New Zealand as well. And so we'll find a way to share some insights about New Zealand too. We'll share a little bit about the methodology and our approach to the ANZ EdTech 50. Of course, we'll be sharing the EdTech 50 um, itself. Um, straight after this session, it'll be available on the Holland IQ website. And shortly after this session, you'll re receive a recording as well. Maria is going to share a little bit about global context, how the Australian ecosystem and EdTech 50 compares to those other regions of the world that we've covered so far. And the most exciting part of this session is we're going to hear from six of the teams who are on the EdTech 50. They're going to provide a short five minute overview of their teams and what they're up to and where they're headed. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll share a little bit about how you can learn more about the EdTech 50 as well. Spoiler alert, on the right-hand side, you can see that the Holland IQ platform zoomed in on Melbourne, which is the most represented city as part of the ANZ EdTech 50 um, as well. So let's make a start. Uh, David, over to you. Do you mind sharing some, some insights for us on the Australian ecosystem? Absolutely. And, and being Melbourne-based, I'm excited by zooming on the <laughs> Melbourne map as well. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, the Australian EdTech ecosystem is growing really um, fast there. Basically, if you're generating a couple of million dollars a year in Australia, you're an export company. 100% of them are exporting. Large portions of their revenue are coming internationally as well. Um, the Australian EdTech ecosystem, is. this is where they are trying to sell their product to. And the interesting factor here is that I think if we went and looked at this map a couple of years ago, we would have seen a bigger concentration targeting the higher ed and the vocational space, and it's moving to the workforce, which is one of the mega trends we're seeing around the world as well. And the Australian ethic ecosystem is definitely following that trend. Um, we've got a really healthy, and this graph really shows us very, very clearly that 50% of the 600 Australian EdTech companies are really early stage startups, which is a fantastic opportunity, which it just means the sector's growing and growing and growing all the time. And it provides another few opportunities, potentially also around that idea of um, consolidation in the market and potentially rolling up some companies and doing some really impactful things globally. But the established companies are making a really big impact both locally and internationally and affect impacting learners around the world. Uh, again, we can see this where distribution, obviously, New South Wales and Victoria and um, sorry, Sydney and Melbourne are heavily represented. But in our top 50, I think it's flipped a little bit. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the characteristics we're seeing a lot more startups coming out of Sydney than we are out of Melbourne. So maybe there's some opportunity there across the country. But obviously, this represents a little bit like the rest of Australia's economic impact across most verticals. Mm -hmm. 
And finally, just as a broad number here, there are 600 Australian EdTech companies. They employ 13,000 people and generate on average two, uh, across the year $2.2 .2 billion worth of revenue. And going back to that earlier slide, that suggests about a quarter of that revenue is coming from offshore learners, which is just an incredible impact for a reasonably small market in Australia. And, you know, we'll, we'll put some numbers around New Zealand in the coming months as well. Awesome. Hey, thanks, David. Wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, looking forward to following uh, more and uh, as the Australian ecosystem matures as well. So great work on edge growth, mate. Thanks, Patrick. All right, let's dive straight into the ANZ EdTech 50. Firstly, on methodology. So um, you can see by the numbers that David talked about, when you include New Zealand, we evaluated over 700 organisations across, across the region, across Australia and New Zealand. Um, there is an enormous um, quality and depth in this group and perhaps the hardest part of, uh, of this process is going from 700 teams doing incredible things for learners and for institutions um, across the region and around the world down to 50. It's really hard. We start with eligibility. Firstly, companies that have been acquired or listed are not included in, um, in scope. Generally, companies that are older than 10 years as well Another really tricky area is as teams mature and move their headquarters. We've had a number of instances, particularly in the last year, of teams that have moved out of Australia into the US, into Europe and other markets as they've grown too. Those teams are out of scope. Um, we cover the current headquarters. We've also got some you know, great diversity out of Australia, of course, um, expats, founders from all over the world who reside in Australia and set up their teams here. We cover five key criteria for all of our regional 100s and 50s. Firstly, we look at the market, the quality and the attractiveness, and that's not just the geographic market, that might be the vertical they're in, the segment that they're focusing on too. Their product, the quality, the uniqueness and demonstrated impact of their product. The team, demonstrated expertise, the diversity of the team as well. Capital or um, perhaps more accurately, their financial health not just about with a team raising sufficient money, this is about being able to access sufficient resources. That might be through revenue funding or other mechanisms, but it's important that the team can continue the important work that they've started. And then finally, momentum, demonstrated on a variety of metrics that they are continuing to grow and achieve solid momentum and velocity and, and impact over time. So without further ado, and as mentioned, this will be on the uh, HoloNQ website straight after this session. We'll be sharing it on social media and you'll get a recording. Here we go, the 2020 Australia and New Zealand EdTech 50. As I said, perhaps the most difficult part is getting to this 50. There are teams just outside and a long way outside the 50 who are doing incredible work. Maria, do you wanna share more about the 50? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Hi, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. And it's it's super exciting, of course, to announce the Australian New Zealand EdTech 50. One of the things that's um, struck us, because we're doing this all around the world, and each ecosystem has its own personality, really, in terms of the market. And what we see here is an incredibly balanced group. And so, you know, on the left hand down the bottom side, left hand bottom side there, education management analytics, I think it's super interesting um, that we're seeing um, EdTech companies supporting institutions, Australian institutions, whether they be K-12 vocational or higher education, are a long, well, and well known for uptake of technology and we see a very good support system there from, um, from EdTech. If we jump into the next slide, I'm going to come back to, the, to that in a minute. But here we see, and David, you mentioned this earlier, you know, really very strong K-12. Um, sector. You know, Australian institutions, like I said, are, you know, well used technology in teaching, learning and also in administration. And so you can see that there in the K-12, um, the strength, but workforce and higher education, they're sort of on par there and a, a small slice of pre-K as well. And moving to the next slide, Patrick, um, um, I think it's a 80-20 split between New Zealand and Australia. Love to see those New Zealand uh, teams and congratulations to you all. And we did a bit of a city city split there, and um, I think Patrick gave it away. Melbourne, for, for those of you who are the Melbourne-Sydney rivals, it's a bit of a rivalry. Uh, Melbourne comes out on top. There are more um, Melbourne-based companies in this EdTech um, in this EdTech 50 than um, uh, than than any other. Uh, and then you know we see 
um, we see Sydney, of course, and Brisbane. Great to see Auckland, Wellington and Dunedin. But also there are single cities. There are teams in this that are, you know, dotted around Australia and New Zealand. So congratulations to, the, to them. And the next one, Patrick, um, if we just look at um, just a little bit more of the makeup. Have a look at the slices of colours there. And that's what I mean by really balanced. There are some other parts of uh, the world where we're doing these uh, air tech 50s and 100s where there's a dominance in one area. But I really do like to see this very, very balanced portfolio of ed tech supporting institutions or moving to B to C. Um, David, you mentioned earlier when we did some of, some of this analysis, um, you know, a, a sort of a va sort of vast majority of the ed tech New Zealand, Australian New Zealand ed tech 50 are B2B, but we're seeing some B2C as well. And, you know, so for example, curriculum and learning resources, some fantastic teams injecting, um, you know, digital, interactive digital into curriculum and learning resources. Same with learning environments, not just, uh, you know, not just an empty sort of vessel in terms of learning environment, but authoring tools, giving the power to the teacher or to the learner to, to build their own um, their own uh, education resources. Of course, STEAM and coding, you see that's quite strong given the, the K-12. Um, and education management and analytics, and I think um, this is an area that's absolutely quite strong and going to grow. Um, as, as Patrick said, you'll get this, you'll get the, um, the, the, the slides and so on are available on our website and uh, and the recording afterwards. I think we need to move straight on to the global learning landscape, um, given the time. So, you know, Patrick said we've been doing this um, these EdTech 50s and 100s around the world, and we do link back to our global learning landscape. If you haven't seen it, do have a look. Moving through to say, for example, as as a few examples of the EdTech uh, EdTech 50s and 100s that we've done, Russia and the CIS very, very interesting market, actually a massive market. And their huge strength there is on deep tech, cyber, coding, you know, um, AI and so on. And moving forward into, um, you know, Nordic and Baltic, even though they're similar geographies, Nordic and Baltic, super interesting, very, very K-12 he heavy. Uh, and also um, deep tech heavy, whether it be uh, AI and robotics, um, virtual reality game simulation, steam encoding, very heavy on that side of it. Um, the LATAM, on the other hand, um, that's quite a privatised education market generally. Um, the strength in ed tech is, is really quite um, strong around the, um, around the upskilling space. Lots of work in that area by ed techs at the moment, and mostly B two C environment in that in that regard. And finally, um, Africa. I mean, also super interesting market. Um, one of the unique things about the Africa ed tech market, also hugely K twelve, something like eighty percent K twelve, um, but um, lots of support for language and literacy, and supporting teachers and schools. Um, to, to move forward in, um, in delivering education to those markets. So that's just a, a very quick roundup, but you'll find all this on our website as well if you want to deep dive a little further. Patrick, back over to you. Fabulous. All right, let's meet some of the teams who make up the ANZ um, EdTech 50. We're really privileged to have six of those teams today. The first team represented by Zoe Milne, founder and director at LoopLearn. Zoe, can you share a little bit more about LoopLearn with us all? Yeah, certainly. Thanks for having me today, Patrick. Uh, so at Loopland, basically, we have developed solutions for automating identification and attendance taking at schools. Uh, so if you want to flip over to the next slide there, Patrick. Um, essentially, I don't think it matters where we are in the world. We all expect our children to be safe when they're dropped off at school. And that means as a society, we put a great deal of expectation on our schools to make sure that they're going to deliver a great, uh, like safe environment and ensure that um, every school is delivering on their duty of care. And that includes providing adequate supervision of all people who are on a school campus. And when I say supervision, that's not just for students themselves, that's also going to be ensuring that all the visitors, contractors, volunteers, uh, any guests at all that are coming onto a campus are authorised to be there and that they have completed necessary sign-in procedures. So to put it really simply, uh, you can never have a stranger walking around on a school campus. From a student perspective, it's the responsibility of a school or school staff to ensure that all the students are accounted for and that students don't go missing throughout the school day. Uh, and that way, 
and, and basically the way then that schools, uh, the way that we as a society set the expectation on schools uh, to deliver a minimum standard of care is by getting governments to actually enforce things like role marking in the classroom. And that will vary from state to state in Australia and there's different requirements around the world in the education market. Uh, but in some states that's, that's mandated in uh, every period of the day. And that basically means that you're gonna have teachers that are taking time out of their lessons to literally just mark students' names off a list um, in some sort of system or pen and paper or into a uh, digital kind of system that they'll log into. And because that's a manual process, it's inherently error prone. You know, you've got schools that are really versatile places. You've got students that are coming and going all the time. You've got all of these visitors that are going to be on campus moving around um, all the time as well. And setting that expectation on schools to ensure that their whole environments, you know, from the front gate to you know the back tennis courts are, are safe, um, can be a really complicated thing for them to deliver. And they certainly, um, you know, do their best with the with the tools that they have. Uh, but one of the reasons why we set out to develop the technology that we've built at Loopland is to help support staff to deliver on that duty of care. And a big part of being able to do that is being able to automate that attendance taking. So whether that's for students, but then also all of the guests and visitors that are walking around uh, on, on a school premises. And we did that by inventing and creating our own specialised AI facial recognition solution they can automate attendance taking across the school campus. So the Loopland solution is a combination of proprietary software and hardware, and it manages sign-in procedures for any guests that are coming onto the campus, as well as early departures and late arrivals for students. Uh, and it will also um, automatically take the role of students in classrooms and uh, versatile learning spaces, like music tutorial rooms, um, uh, your gymnasiums, these, these places where extracurricular activities will happen. Uh, where it might not be as easy for students, uh, sorry, for teachers to take the role and to be able to, to provide the supervision to students and being able to do that in, a, in an, automated, or an automated way. So the reason that the Loopland solution is quite different to any other computer vision or facial recognition technologies out there is that we have specifically designed the technology for the use in schools. And so we actually have a global patent around our computer vision process uh, that's focused on the protection of each individual's privacy. So that basically means that we have invented a way to be able to not require the need for any recording video footage. So we aren't security cameras or anything like that. We don't hold any data owned by the school themselves. Um, so there's no third party risks involved there at all. And then we have our SAS kind of computer solution that will be able to automatically provide updates for, um, for staff and being able to integrate through to student information systems so that it's nice and easy for teachers and staff members to be able to see um, where people are around their school campus, uh, whether that's students or you know, risks of contractors, visitors, anyone else that might be on the campus that isn't supposed to be there as well. So focus on that, uh, the communication elements as well that we can bring to supporting, uh, to supporting schools. Uh, so you can flip back over that last uh, slide now if you want, Patrick. Uh, but basically that's our website. If you do want to learn more or get in touch with us, you can contact us at uh, www.lifeland.net. Um, we do have uh, work with schools across Australia. We are looking at growing the team and growing out internationally. Certainly see this as a, as a global space that we can provide help within the education sector. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, please do get in touch. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Zoe. It's so great to see a team such as yours building advanced technology with that, you know, the mindset that you're bringing for schools as well and being really centric around the, the school's requirements, the teacher's requirements and privacy too. Um, sounds, sounds like you've really thought that through. So um, expecting big, exciting future for Loop Learn. And thanks so much for joining us and sharing more about um, you and your team today. Great. Thanks for that, Patrick. Thanks, Zoe. All right, moving right along, uh, I'd like to introduce Ryan Trainer and Lincoln Trainer from Adventus. Thanks so much, both of you, for joining us and share a little bit more about the work that you're doing. Thanks, thanks, Patrick, and thanks, Maria. And also just... Uh, also, just thanks to Hall and IQ as well. Like it's, uh, we actually set ourselves this a year, a year or so back. So we're really uh, proud to kind of be part of this today, and also to Edgy Growth as well, doing an amazing job, kind of building the ecosystem in Australia as well. So, so thanks for that. But um, look, um, might just go to the next slide there, Patrick. We'll kind of 
going formal today. Just a, a quick, you're not seeing double today as well. Lincoln and I are brothers uh, on the on the screen as well. We've got a similar haircut to use with yourself as well, Patrick. You just uh, so we just um, look just. I just wanted to quickly introduce the team. Obviously, myself and Link um, as co-founders, but it's really important to introduce uh, Victor uh, Rajivan and also Richard. You know, Victor's had a wealth of experience over 25 years in education, and and Richard's really the architect and brains behind the platform as well. So uh, it's just going to a, a massive job to kind of get us to this stage. Um, I think when you start kind of looking at why we actually started um, Adventus IO, I mean, at the end of the day, we were working with a one of the state governments and we realised that, you know, one in three students that were arriving into our country were actually transferring um, to a different institution. And it kind of started asking the question, like, why is this actually happening? Being a father of three daughters at the same time, like it's one of the largest purchasing decision in often a family's life. Um, yet they're kind of landing and it's they're not having confidence in that decision. And we started to dig deeper and found out that, you know, 70% of students still make decisions through um, local recruiters. Yet the average recruiter had about between 10 to 30 institutional partners. So there was, there was, people were often talking about ethics, but it was really that there was a lack of access um, to inventory to be able to provide the student with the right choice. So basically, we jumped on planes, uh, went around the world, and um, just on the next slide, Patrick, we, we started looking at, you know, how, how, from the agent's perspective and from the institution's perspective, and, you know, you look at agents and, you know, they, they were basically working a lot with brochures, trying to do a good job to be able to support the student. Um, but really, we were looking at how, if we could a, uh, actually democratise access to inventory and create a beautiful um, process for them to be able to um, ensure and empower the parent and the, stu the student to be able to make the right decision, um, how do we actually do that? And then we looked from the institution perspective and we said, God, you know, how do they actually source a trusted network of agents from around the world? Um, how do they actually target enrolments to create diversity? Um, how do they actually get really specific with analytics and data to be able to help them find the right student for the right seat at the right time? So what we, we did is we um, we went around the world and then we launched um, Inventors IO, which is this on the next, plat next uh, slide there, which is really around um, a marketplace which helps um, democratise access to, of inventory to the recruiters network. And that's not just normal recruiters like agents, but that could be counsellors and tutors, uh, um, English language, a whole range of different groups and help them optimise their inventory um, with the recruitment trusted network. And, and then how do we help the recruiters then work through to create a beautiful experience to make sure that the parent and the student feel absolutely satisfied where their students travelling all around the world. And, um, and we've seen some enormous growth um, on that, which we'll touch on in a moment. But Link, do you want to kind of talk a little bit of, around the, I guess, from the agent and institution side? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So yeah, uh, what's what's exciting is we launched our global marketplace uh, that Ryan mentioned in June this year, which provides this end-to-end -end student enrolment uh, solution for our partners, which really is truly shifting this uh, our the student recruitment industry from analog to digital. And it all began in the middle of the year with our global online rollout through South Asia and Southeast Asia. And, and we've really achieved ex an extraordinary amount of growth in a short space of time with over 1,500 agents subscribing to our marketplace in the past five months and getting 100 new agents now signing up every week. So it's been a pretty amazing journey. And, and the value drivers that are really driving these agents uh, signing up on our platform is growth through growing their business through 100% uh, commission model which is really uh, revolutionary in the industry. It's really passing on all the university placement commission to the agent. And this not only adds value to them, but also creates a neutral marketplace. Uh, access to the inventory that Ryan spoke about, access to actually a global portfolio of institutions across all major destinations, which they normally can't access. And having the smart tools, which you can see in this slide, uh, to provide faster conversions in the process and you can see some of the features here, you know, predictive offers, um, giving student portal, one application to multiple universities. There's all these smart features that really speed up the process and create a lot of efficiency for our partners. If we go to the next 
slide. You can see also on the institution side of the marketplace, uh, we've now signed up over 830 plus institutions, over seven major destinations. And um, you know, what we're doing for the institutions, we're not only providing them quality students, a diverse source of students from around the world, but we're providing them specialised marketing tools with deep analytics for institutions to connect them to the applicant at the point of decision making in the application process which is really critical for the institutions. And you can see here a promoted campaign providing the deeper details um, for the student when they're making that decision. If we move on to this, the second last slide here, you can see finally that, you know, it began, our, our company began with 14 team members and four co-founders in 2018. We've now grown to over 190 plus team members across 14 offices the marketplace is booming. We've got over 830 institutions, as I said, 1,500 agents, and it really is providing um, the, the institutions with the ability to access $5 billion of gross tuitional value as we scale and grow our marketplace around the world. And this, just to finish off, I'll, I'll hand back to Ryan. Really, really quickly, guys, is that it just um, we've got we we talk about our founders, but we talk about really our founding 200, which is I guess all our team members from around the world, and I guess part of I guess celebrating today is with our team and like they a lot of people took a, a punt to come on board with us, and um, we've got we're almost like a family here at Adventus, so um, we kind of think about us as the founding 200, our first 200. So just a, a big thank you to our whole team around the world as well. Thanks, guys, and so cool that you acknowledge the the whole team effort. I'm sure it, it took 200 people to achieve such incredible growth. I mean, you guys are flying. It's so impressive. Thanks so much for joining uh, joining us and sharing more about Adventus. One to watch, no doubt about it. Um, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Lincoln. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thanks. All right, moving right along to Sandra Heldsinger. Sandra is the MD and founder of Bright Path. Sandra, can you share more about BrightPath with us all? Yeah, thank you. It's a great opportunity. Lovely to be with you all. And I'm coming to you from beautiful Western Australia, so not a Melbourne or Sydney company. Lovely. Um, our field is educational measurement. So before I talk about our product, I think it's useful for me to help you think about there are aspects of learning that are really well serviced through um, assessments using multiple choice and short answer questions. But there are large aspects of learning that need to be ass assessed through extended performances. Now, Steve Humphrey and I started this research going back over 20 years ago, and we've commercialised our research through the University of Western Australia. We've done a lot of work looking at rubrics. Rubrics are very popular in education. We weren't convinced they were taking us in the right direction, so we wanted to find an assessment process that will allow us to get really good data from teachers' assessments of their own students' work um, and of their students' extended performances. And it's that research. So while Steve and I have worked across the full gamut of educational measurement, it's this research that has started off Bright Path. How do we help teachers assess extended performances? And this is basically the assessment, the image here is the assessment process that we've developed. So in the middle, we have our Bright Path scale. To the, the left, we have the thumbnails are calibrated exemplars. Now, each of those exemplars, through our research, we've been able to work out that each of those exemplars are telling us a little bit more about how um, the construct develops. So in this instance, it'll be narrative writing. The performance on the far left is one of the exemplars, opened up, ready to be read. And then the, the teacher's looking at her student's performance on the right. So basically, we've called it the teacher's ruler because it's a matter of working along that ruler, deciding where your student fits. And the big breakthrough, there are two aspects to the big breakthrough in our research. One is we get a standardized test score from teacher judgments of their own students' work, and we get reliable data. Reliable data meaning that a score of 380 means the same thing across teachers in a school and it means the same thing across um, schools. So as you can see in the next slide, we continue to research this and publish our findings. So we're not really a tech company, we're a research company 
where we're looking for technology to get our research out into schools and to be readily used in schools. So on the next slide, there are um, two aspects to our impact. One is usage and one is impact on student learning. So if I talk about usage for a moment, Bright Path has been adopted as part of the state testing program in Western Australia, but we are being used in schools across Australia. What's interesting is right from the start, there, we've been of interest and we've got strong advocates from a very diverse type of school. So very small remote schools in Arnhem land are using Bright Park, as are the high fee paying schools in Sydney. So I think that we're really doing something right, that we're meeting such diverse schools needs. We've had a million assessments completed. Now, bearing in mind, this isn't kids sitting in front of the computer and just answering questions. This is teachers having to go in and assess their own students. So it's going to be, um, it's a harder bar to get uh, the volume of assessments up. But we're pleased we're in 980 schools, over 20,000 students and 400,000, uh, sorry, 20,000 teachers, 400,000 students. So we're making good progress. Um, and the next slide, uh, the other aspect of what we're wanting to do is really understand um, so sorry my slides are slightly out of order first of all let me talk to this point we are having a dramatic impact in education in australia so our data is informing national curriculum initiatives also um, many of you will recognize john hattie john hattie was part of an expert panel who looked at recommendations for initiatives nationally and that expert panel recommended that bright path was one of the few tools available to schools to be aligned with well-constructed learning progressions. So we're well recognized in the Australian space. In the next slide, if I've remembered correctly, this is the one I want to talk to you about impact of, on learning. So the School Curriculum and Standards Authority did a conducted a study independent of us where they uh, engaged the services of a university in Sydney to look at what impact Bright Path is having on student learning. So there were 12,000 students in the study um, in 113 schools, and they were looking at student performance on our national testing program, NAPLAN. And what they could see is when we looked at growth over time, so tracking the students over time, we could see that students in high usage Bright Path schools progressed substantially more than students not using Bright Path. So we've got a really solid foundation. The research is telling us that reliability is great. We've got the research that's telling us that the use of Bright Path is leading to um, improved student learning. So we're well placed now to scale, and that's what we're doing, a, a, a lot of work happening to scale. So we're going to scale both the, um, the use of Bright Path for extended performances, but on the next slide, I also want to just mention us and part of um, the scaling in terms of the extended performances. In our review of NAP plans, there's just a, a very large review of our national testing program completed earlier this year. And that review found that it often it was um, noted that the use of teacher professional judgment was missing from our national testing program. And the review recommended a revisioning of our national testing program to um, make explicit provision for the use of teacher judgment. So it's on the back of that that we know that we're really well placed to scale our product in, in terms of national initiatives. We've also, on the next slide, just to flag with you, we've gone through a big product build and we've gone back to the other aspects of research that we've worked on around um, assessing learning through multiple choice and short answer questions. And we've gone to trial this week on trialing our new comprehensive suite of formative mathematics <coughs> assessments. And what we're trying to do in those assessments is ensure we don't want teachers to have to try and work out what the data means. We've used high-end psychometrics and then thought very carefully, how do we convey that to the student, to the teacher? So they pick it up and they know this is what I need to teach next. And that's really an overarching um, requirement in all our work is helping teachers know what they need to do tomorrow in the classroom based on how they've assessed their students. 
Now, we think that this is going to be very popular. We put a call out to Western Australian schools to help us trial the product. And within 48 hours, we had 200 schools banging our doors and they continue to banging, bang our doors to be part of the, um, the work that we're doing. So we're, we're poised now for a very busy 2021. And I think we're all looking forward to getting rid of 2020. So thanks very much. Thanks for this opportunity, Patrick and Maria. Thanks so much, Sandra. That was so, so much depth. I feel like we should get a badge for that presentation on, on <laughs> assessment or something. So impressive. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks for sharing what's happening and, and no doubt what's going to happen at Bright Path. Thanks again, Sandra. Thanks very much. All right, moving right along to Cluey Learning, I'd like to introduce Mark Roll, the CEO of Cluey. Mark, tell us more. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, Let's go to the first slide, if you don't mind, Patrick. Um, following the exit of our last business, which was Open Colleges that I co-founded to Apollo Global in 2015, there was a key question that was puzzling many of us, and that is, why is it we had seen such fundamental transformation of post-schooling education through, through the use of the internet, big data and learning analytics, and yet when we looked at classroom K-12 based education, it felt stuck in this industrialized model. When we look at a classroom today, 40 years ago or 100 years ago, it looks remarkably familiar. And what we notice is that who's at the center of the learning in the classroom, it's the teacher. And what does modern, what does modern teaching and learning theory tell us? If you want great teaching and learning to happen, you need to have the student at the center of everything that happens. And schools have identified that there is this problem that they're unable to address the individual learning needs of every student. And we know that students have individual learning needs because we test the hell out of them. NAPLAN years three, five, seven, nine, then HSC, VC, QC. And we know that every student's at a different place in their learning journey. How do we try and solve their problems? We put the same kids of the same age group, learning the same content, going at the same pace in a classroom. The six by five, seven by five model. Six rows, five kids in a row, taught seven times a day, five times a week. That model was built in the industrial revolution and was designed to massify education. And it has done just that. It is for the masses. When we look at the performance data, Australia is declining consistently on by PISA measures and in terms of NAPLAN scores, at best, we're kind of static, if not declining. And this is not a funding problem. Government has been tipping huge amounts of funding into K-12 learning. They've just been putting it in the wrong place. Can we go to the next slide, please? So schools know that they have this problem and they've been trying to turn to tools that have been used in post-schooling education to address this. First thing they did, they connected every classroom to the internet. They swapped a whiteboard, a blackboard for a digital whiteboard, didn't move the dial because it just brought more content into the classroom. And what did that tell us? We never had a problem with content. We've always had good textbooks. Secondly, they brought in video-based learning. Then they brought gamified learning and the dial didn't shift. And the fundamental reason why it hasn't shifted is most of those tools are, a are, are asynchronous and school kids need to learn synchronously. So parents and students have moved en masse outside of the classroom for their learning support. Of the 4 million students in Australian schools, around 1.6 million currently use tutoring or intend using tutoring or test prep in the next 12 months. And nearly 2 million additional students are turning outside of the classroom for other learning supports. And when they go to tutoring or test prep, in the main, it is stuck in an industrialized model. You either go to a private tutor who comes to your home or you go there. We call that the pay and pray model. You pay and you pray. You have no idea what that tutor is doing with your child or you send your kid into a learning center, a smaller class, better teacher, slightly better version of a classroom. And we looked at this and we said, this is madness. Where is technology, big data, learning analytics that's going to power the learning? Can we go to the next slide, please? So we sat back and we said, if we're going to build optimum teaching and learning for school children, what would it need to look like? And we said, it's not just about matching a student with a tutor. You need four key elements. One, you need a plan for every student, a detailed learning plan with all the digital learning content in micro bite sized pieces, all scoped and sequenced and matched to the syllabus. That content and curriculum and the plan needs to sit in a fully adaptive, fully synchronized learning environment, 
video, audio, collaborative whiteboard, and then we need to match every student with their personal tutor, either one-to-one -one or in small groups, who guides, mentors, and supports the student through their learning. Then we need to deliver targeted practice between each learning session to reinforce the concepts. And then we need to track all the data. And we measure over 100,000 data points in every learning session. And we use the qualitative data from the tutor's feedback with the quantitative data from our, big, our analytics to provide detailed progress reporting to the parent, the student, and the tutor after every learning session. Next slide, please. Now, to do this is hard. You've got to be good at a lot of things all at the same time. The first thing we did is we raised 11 million of our own capital and we built all the core technology stacks, the full video, the full audio collaborative whiteboard. We built the entire Australian curriculum digitally. It's all housed in our learning environment. We then put all of that on top of our enterprise level platforms where we have the single source of truth for all our data. And that enables us to build automated workflows, customized workflows and self-service configurations to enable us to be able to scale effectively. Next slide, please. People often ask me, What's your core competitive advantage? Is it your tech? Is it your content? What is it? The answer is it's the learning analytics. It's the big data that we use to be able to drive every single learning session and optimize it. We feed every data learning session through our AI and analytics, and it automatically flags to us any quality assurance issues. We're now operating at scale where we're delivering over 20,000 learning sessions a month. Next slide, please. We get our tutors from two core sources, current and past teachers, and in the main university students, we wrap all of our infrastructure around the tutor, the learning program, the content, the big data learning analytics, the collaborative environment, and that enables those tutors to become expert teachers and educators using our infrastructure. Next slide, please. We are now at scale. We are appealing to a broad group of students our student demographics almost identically track ABS data. Around 50% of our students are in primary schools. And most interestingly, we're delivering approximately 61% of our learning sessions to students who are in public schools. Next slide, please. We are now scaling significantly. We delivered 52,000 learning sessions in our last quarter, and we're now tracking to run over 20,000 learning sessions a month. We have over 5,500 active students. And I'm delighted to announce that we will be uh, heading to the ASX on the 9th of December. We have just completed a $30 million capital raising, which was six times covered. We had $170 million bid into our book within the first 24 hour, hours of us doing the raising. Um, and now we have the gun, I say to my team, now we have the gunpowder to really go hard, really go fast. We've come a long way in three years, from start to finish to this point in three years. The market is wide open. The parents are turning on mass to the internet. We've optimized our teaching and learning model and we're ready to go. So we're extremely excited. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Mark. Always love your energy. So impressive that the pace that you guys have mobilized and grown and something tells me you're just getting started. So thank you for joining us, Mark, and uh, big kudos to the team as well. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> All right, moving right along, um, we're, we've got a New Zealand-based team and, and founder here in Chatterize, Lane Litz. Can you share a little bit more about Chatterize with us? Absolutely. I'm going to try to match the energy level of the previous pitch. Do you think I can do, do it? Do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Chatterize. At Chatterize, we build conversational chatbots that help young Chinese kids speak English with confidence. But our mission, next slide please, is significantly greater than that. Intelligent conversational technology will not just transform the way we deliver education, it will change access, equalize access to education for children around the world. All we're talking any child, anywhere, any subject, any time. Next slide. We are headed, uh, our team is a very qualified, passionate team of educators. My name is Lane. I was formerly the head of education and teacher services, as well as employee number six at VIP Kid. My co-founder, Belisa, was a second year employee and head of teacher acquisition at VIP Kid. Together, Belisa and I supported the growth of VIP Kid to 70% of the online English tutoring market share 
and built the largest online teacher pool in the world. Our technical lead is Jean Sheen or Kane Ma. Kane is an all around uh, generalist, everything from full stack development to app development. He has ex extensive experience in the Chinese market. And uh, the greater chatter I assume is spread across New Zealand and China. We are headed straight and directly for China because China loves learning English. The Chinese online K through 12 language learning market is one of the biggest and fastest growing ed tech markets in the world. But we cannot forget that the vast majority of the Chinese population actually lives outside of tier one and tier two Chinese cities, right? 70% of the Chinese population lives in tier three through five cities. And while solutions for spoken English exist in tier one cities, these solutions at 25 US dollars uh, for 25 minutes of class are inaccessible and unaffordable to children and families in this third through fifth tier city area. There is a huge problem in China, which is that Chinese kids study English from the age of three all the way to the age of 22. And at the end of their university are still terrified to speak out. This is actually a problem for second language learners across the world who are learning a second language in their home country. And it boils down to this. They have no one to talk to until now. Welcome to Talk Town. Next slide, please. <laughs> Welcome to Talk Town. Talk Town is a conversational world inside of your child's phone or computer. For ju just 10 minutes a day, your kid can go and talk to Frank at the cafe. Right or get groceries from Shopmart or play with Tim and Tim's toys. We offer double, over double the conversational language practice than any other mobile-led app on the market. Next slide, please. Our approach to market here was in the middle of February, right during coronavirus, to launch TalkTown as a WeChat mini program, taking advantage of WeChat's 1.3 billion monthly active users. We experienced phenomenal growth over the past six months or so, up to 65,000 users with triple the retention rates of apps like Duolingo. Next slide, please, Patrick. Moving forward, we're taking our WeChat mini program and transitioning it, transitioning it into a very active, healthy funnel, moving users from our mini program to our app. Welcome to Speakia. Speakia is a conversational world and I'll just talk about the next slide, steps for Speakia. Students log into Speakia, choose a topic, start their lesson. They learn important vital vocabulary words through voice-activated gaming. They take these vocabulary and plug them into sentence structures through voice-activated sentence practice. And they build all of these elements together to have a true-to-life, non-linear, Choose your own ending conversation. Next slide, please, Pat. Moving forward, we're looking for 15,000 paid users to generate $3 million US dollars worth of revenue. We're looking at a lifetime value of a user at about 220 US dollars, which seems high for the Australian New Zealand market. But in China, for third through fifth tier cities, this is only 10 to 20% of the wallet. We're expecting to, uh, to spend about a third of the cost in, uh, in uh, acquisition, of course. And in the next slide, please don't take it from me. I'm a little bit biased. <laughs> Kids love us because they think that we're a game. They're like, I want to play this game. And parents love us because the most important thing that we provide is the opportunity for their child to speak more English in 10 minutes than they have in all the years of their life. Thank you very much for listening. Now is a great opportunity for you to grab your phone and if you have WeChat, scan that QR code. That was awesome, Lane, thanks. And you you, you did a great job on the energy, no doubt about yeah, it. <laughs>
Thank you. You've um, and you've picked one of the biggest global ed tech markets. I mean, you know that better than most of us, right? Um, so super impressive to see just the next evolution and another approach to tackling such a massive challenge thanks so much for joining us lane great work to you and the team again we're keeping a close eye out on on where you guys will head no doubt it will be at, at rocket speed thanks for having me thanks lane all right our final team is practera i'd like to introduce wes sonarik from practera co-ceo and co-founder wes can you share some more about what you and the team are up to awesome uh thank you pat maria david it's a pleasure and honor to be here and yeah, I've got to anchor it after all of that wonderful energy and those amazing presentations. So I'm going to do my best. So kick the slide forward and let's kick off. So Procara is an experiential learning technology company. We're headquartered in Australia, but we now have offices in the US, UK, and Canada. Our software platform is used to deliver remote internships, real world projects, learning in the flow of work, and other forms of experiential and work integrated learning that develop the professional skills needed to succeed and grow in the workplace. We're currently working with most of the Australian universities to help them design and deliver online, authentic experiential learning that engages students with employers, from undergraduate, postgraduate, and professionals. Due to COVID and travel bans, we've also been a key response for many of our university customers to engage and retain students who are overseas. And on the next slide, um, look, since it's currently the thing to do here in America, I'm just going to claim that we've won. We are the world's leading platform for experiential learning. All right, well, in reality, this market is in its early days and there is no globally dominant technology vendor. However, COVID has accelerated everything in EdTech and the demand for experiential learning solutions it was still several years away before COVID is here today. Our technology makes it easy for an educator to search through a library of many different forms of experiential learning. They can use anything in the library as a template for their own design, or they can engage with us or one of our partners to customize design or operate an experience on their behalf. Students and employers use friendly mobile apps to coordinate their learning and feedback, while educators use our analytics tools and our dashboards to manage the experience and ensure outcomes. And we integrate with all major learning management systems or can be used standalone. Now on the next slide, I'm gonna give you an idea of the type of experiences we power. This is a sampling of some of our current customers globally. In particular, I'd like to highlight our strategic relationship with Northeastern University. They're not only a customer bringing their world-renowned co-op model of education online, but they're a channel partner. They're bringing our platform to a rapidly growing network of community colleges and K-12 districts, including statewide rollouts in Massachusetts and Illinois. We're also creating a professional development offering with their business school that is being piloted by CBS Health, a US-based employer with over 300,000 employees. Some other examples, our platform supports transnational projects where Students are in one place and doing a project with an employer in another country. And this is enabling virtual mobility and also destination discovery. This is an area of rapid growth for us as COVID and travel bans are expected to continue through 2021 and beyond, hopefully not, but probably. Uh, a mentoring program run by Southern Cross University supports nurses doing their practicums in rural Australia. The city of Boston moved part of its summer youth employability program online with Practera, and it's now making it a year round part of their engagement with underrepresented inner city youth. On the other end of the education spectrum, CSIRO is using Practera to help PhD research, researchers make the transition from academia into industry employment. Now, on the next slide, there's a common theme that all these programs have, and that is that they involve real world experiences that provide employer or expert feedback. Most of these programs are running at scales that were previously impossible to achieve cost effectively, but our platform helps reduce the cost of delivering this type of learning by up to 90% in many cases. As you can see, the quality of the experience and learning is still incredibly high, which has been validated by research studies done in collaboration with our university customers, as well as the participating employers. And as I mentioned, we're growing globally. I had just moved our family from Sydney to Boston this August, which pretty much everyone thought and still thinks we were crazy to do. And at the moment, I don't disagree, but because there's such a demand for what we're doing now, and we need to start building out our North American and European teams, we're here. And we're not currently raising, but we are considering a growth round in the near future, particularly as we see increasing evidence that the appetite for experiential learning is not just a COVID response, but a fundamental shift in how educators prepare learners for the future of work. In closing, on the next slide, I just wanted to thank, um, sorry, one more slide forward. <laughs> in closing, I just wanted to thank our unique team who's helped us get here today. 
who've just been nominated as a finalist for the 2020 Diversity Employer of the Year as part of the Women in Digital Awards. And that's because 70% of our leadership team and 60% of our, all our employees are women, including women of color. From a small technology startup of 40 people, we believe much of our success comes from the experiences, networks, and capabilities of our team, who hail from 18 countries and speak 29 languages. With our diverse team and culture of positive experiences, we are confident we will achieve our mission to be the world's leading platform for experiential learning. And on the next slide, if anyone would like to learn more, see our platform in action, or talk about strategic partnerships or investment, please feel free to reach out to me or my co-founder and co-CEO, Bo Lees. Thank you all. Thank you again, Pat, Maria, David, for recognizing our team's work and having us here today. Thank you so much, Wes. I never forget when we first met you and Bo, so impressed then. We've been you know, super impressed. You guys really are, you know, in the rumor mills of all of the universities and in the post-secondary, people do hold out Practera as one of the world's leading kind of experiential learning teams. And so cool and kudos to you for, again, calling out the contributions from, you know, a very impressive and diverse team too. So thanks so much for sharing all of that with us today. You guys deserve all of the credit. You've done all that hard work and we're excited to see you grow throughout North America and the world as well. Thanks, Wes, and best of the team. Thank you. Wow, that was big. I mean, it's it's one thing to see a bunch of logos. It's a whole nother experience to kind of feel the energy out of these out of these leaders from their teams. David, Maria, kind of just in wrapping up, what are your what are your thoughts after all that? I, again, I'll, I'll start by saying, yeah, I agree. Absolutely. An amazing group of companies and to hear from the, that small cohort. And I'm sure we could have spent the rest of the afternoon hearing from more. And the thing that I think Maria made a point earlier, and I think it's something that really resonates with me is this idea of what the B2C play might look like in the Australian market in the next couple of years. You know, the, the COVID pandemic of 2020 has given us this uh, acute awareness of teachers and the role that they play and educators play. So it's an interesting space. Yeah, thanks, David. I, I agree. I mean, it, it's super impressive. And I think both Australia and New Zealand have got very, very strong, high quality, long standing uh, education systems. Um, openness to technology and use of technology and the, the sort of experience and strength of these teams and one of the things that's you know super clear when when th those teams talk is they're solving real problems I mean real learning problems real institutional problems and real market problems and that's a great place to start for any startup so congratulations I, I've to got you a all. question for you Maria Pratt you guys have your unicorn list have we just met Australia's first edtech unicorn and we met, met them in this group today. Are they on our top 50? That's a very high probability. I mean, I think Cluey Learning has perhaps set a, a definitely an Australian record from startup to IPO. Um, and I think, you know, across that team, I, I think it's a great question. I think it's a little bit like in some respects, and yet, sure, we are biased, but we, we cover the world pretty equally. But I, I, it reminds me of kind of the Nordic Baltics is a really kind of, a small but very focused and strong ecosystem. And, you know, you heard from Practera just now and some of the other teams there. Yes, they're using Australia as a market to focus on and scale, but very much global application with global ambition. So I wouldn't be surprised, David. I wouldn't be surprised. And um, just for everyone, just to, if you if you came in late, you will get the recording straight after this session. It'll be It'll be emailed to you. Um, and the, the the blog around the Australian New Zealand Air Tech 50 is now live on our All right, website. that's us. We're a couple of minutes over time. Thank you so much for everyone, to everyone who joined us this morning, this evening, wherever you are. Um, real pleasure, as Maria said, resources all available on the website. You'll get the recording shortly after. If you're in North America, Europe, India and South Asia, or the Middle East and North Africa, um, you've still got the opportunity to submit applications for your ecosystems. I just can't wait next year, Maria, when we're wrapping up what this kind of global cohort looks like as well. All right. Before you guys go, I should I should say on behalf of the ecosystem, thanks for the work that you do. All right. There's no doubt that Hull and IQ are doing some incredible work and there's no doubt that your research and the impact that you're having is making a huge impact locally. I can talk very clearly for the edge growth ecosystem and the Australian ed tech ecosystem and thank you. And on behalf of all of our partners, Charles Sturt, Griffith, Latrobe, Monash, Deakin University, Navitas, Global Vic, Maddox, ClickView, 
Deloitte and all of our 150 members. I want to say thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, David. Big fan of your Thanks, work. Thanks, David. Love watching Edge Growth grow too. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Have a everyone. great morning, evening, wherever you are. Ciao.